learn the holy words of the Tanya. But I want to make an introduction that today and yesterday by Chabad Hasidim is a very, very important days. This is the yard site of the previous Rebbe was yesterday, Yud Shvat, the 10th of Shvat, Hasidi Yihi Kodesh. The Torah says that the number 10 by the laws of Meiser, of, of tithing the animals, you have to give every 10th animal in your and you, from your cattle, you have to give away to the levy. So that, Asiri Yia Kodesh, you have to give it away to the Koyan, I mean. So, a part of it. So the Torah says that that becomes a symbol. And the Rebbe used it at the previous Rebbe, who was such a holy man, and the Nasi Adair, the, the leader of, of the generation, it's not by coincidence that he passed away in the 10th of Shvat. But what was his mission and what every mm-hmm. tzaddik has their uh, influence on their generation? So he lived in a very difficult time. He was born in 1880 and then he lived through World War I and World mm-hmm. War II. And, and he escaped from the Nazis miraculously and came to the United States and ended, finished his 10 years that he, he was here in Brooklyn with, as a sick man, he was physically, he was on a wheelchair, he didn't feel well, but till the last day of his life, he did everything possible to impact the Hasidim and to direct them to, to be leaders and to inspire the, the broken Jews, everyone was broken, broken hearted, broken in spirit. And he himself lost his daughter and his son in law in the war, in the Holocaust. So he understood very well what he was doing. In the, he was in Warsaw during the, during the bombings, the 1939, when it started. He was there for about two months. And it was chaos and devastating. So he understood very well. He saw firsthand what was going on. The Jewish people needed to be uplifted because everyone was depressed. Everyone was shattered. And this is what he did with all his Mesidus Nefesh, with his self-sacrifice by teaching Hasidos and inspiring people with his truthfulness. Because he was such a MS person, such a holy uh, tzaddik that suffered. So his suffering, his pain was a, 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 a real pain that people could relate to. So it's different if someone tells someone who's suffering, okay, everything will be okay. You don't, don't take it so to heart or try your best. You know, the person feels you're not really relating to them. But someone who's f- going through the same suffering and pain and they're showing tremendous strength and inspiration, that becomes a very, very strong point where we could all feel the, the need to learn from this sadik in every moment that a person feels down you have to go to the teachings of the, this tzaddik who lived in our times. And he was the, actually the one who set up the schedule to learn Tanya every day. Until then, people would learn Tanya, the Hasidim, but not in a structured manner. One person learned one chapter, another person learned another part of the Tanya. It wasn't a cohesive effort. That no one was... Uh, basically on the same page. Everyone was doing that, whatever they felt. He said, it's time to bring everyone together and make a schedule every single day to learn the Chumash of the day with Rashi every single day of the year. Like today is Pasha's Bashalach. You learn the first section of Bashalach, Tul Sheini with the Rashi. Then you learn the Tanya of the day. He made a schedule. And you could find it at Chabad.org. 
and also the Tehillim of the day. The Tehillim is already divided uh, for over the 30 days or sometimes 29 days of the, of the, of the Hebrew month. And he called it Chitas. Chitas means, is an acronym, Chumash, Tehillim, Tanya. The word Chitas means fear. There was, shh, one second. Monsieur, I have to be quiet. There was fear of the of the Jewish people and the nations uh, that wanted to attack them. So it's a long story, but to make it short, he explained that there's a tradition from the holy tzaddikim of Chabad. Whoever will say chitas daily, this will be a zgula. This will be a big, big blessing for them and their family, both materially and spiritually. But it became actually mandatory. Every Chabad Chosid must say Chitas. And there's no way to get around it. In fact, I'll tell you a personal story about my father, Zayn Gesund. My father, he spoke, he said the story on the gem. It was, they played it already twice, international. So, because they interview people and everyone who heard the story was very inspired. In the 1960s, my father had a difficult time financially. He got scammed by a person, not, not Jewish. He was living in, in, in my father's basement in Brooklyn. And there was, he, he took everything he had from him. It was a professional scammer. So what happened was, what happened was that at that time, my father was working at night, night shifts, to, to try to get some money, you know, extra money to support his family. And he would write to the Rebbe occasionally, and the Rebbe always would respond to him in, in letters or notes through the secretary to give him strength. But this time the Rebbe didn't answer. My father was really upset. He wrote again. Again, the Rebbe did, ignored it. Finally, the third time, the Rebbe wrote Chitas with a question mark or two question marks, meaning, you're not, are you saying Chitas? If you're my chosid, why aren't you saying Chitas? How did the Rebbe in his room in 770 know that my father's not saying Chitas? He started to say Chitas, and the Rebbe started to answer him again on his questions. Then a, a period later, again, he started to get weak with the chitas again because he was working at night. So when you work at night, your whole system is turned upside down. You don't sleep normal. You're nervous. You're running to work. You, you know, you can't think straight. And again, he missed chitas. And again, the rabbi stopped answer him, answering him. Until finally he got the message. And from that time on, for the last 50 years, he never missed the day of chitas. Okay, that was the introduction for today to understand, to explain to us, and to, we should understand that the learning of Tanya is mandatory for every Chabad Chosid. And even though we're not on the, that schedule, we're on a different schedule because different learning curriculum because we started, you know, According, and we go at a different time, and we're going at a different pace, but that's okay. We're trying our best, but if you want to follow the chitas, the tanya of the day, you go on chabad.org. They have teachers that explain it to you in video, also audio, like go line by line, and it's not so difficult. It's not complicated. You could follow. We're on chapter seven. So this chapter is challenging for every person who learns it. Why? Because it really challenges the way we think and the way we operate and the way we feel. So imagine a person who's 50 or 60 years old and, and, and the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya is telling us that 
what you're saying or like or what you're doing or what you're feeling or what you're thinking is not so appropriate. But you, you start saying to yourself, I, I'm not a bad guy. I'm a good person. I'm trying my best. I don't hurt anyone. I, I, I'm, I'm a, try to do good for other people. That's all correct. But he's going deeper. He's digging deeper into the deeper resources of a Jew. What does that mean? For instance, he's going to tell us here that if a person eats, he eats and food, he drinks, but he doesn't think that he's doing it for the sake of Hashem. He's not doing it because he's, he's not thinking that he needs koach, he needs strength to continue having strength, physical strength, and mental strength to help him more spiritually. In order to learn Torah, in order to do mitzvot, you have to have physical strength. If a person has a headache or a toothache, whatever the case, whatever the situation, they can't concentrate. They're going to deal with their physical deficiency first. So what does Hashem do for us? He says, eat and sleep well and take care of your body because your body is a vehicle to serve Hashem, to do more mitzvot. Without your body, you're weak. The Rambam says, Heyeis haguf, body v'sholem, midarke avedis Hashem ho, that a person who takes care of his body physically, and he makes sure that he's healthy, he's going to be able to serve Hashem much better. Because... You have the strength. But what happens when a person eats and sleeps and takes care of their body or does exercise and doesn't think that they're doing it because they need more koyach to serve Hashem? They're just doing it because they want to feel good or they want to lose weight or they uh, want to live longer. They want to have more quality of life. But they're not associating the, the eating and the sleeping and the exercise with serving Hashem. So we're going to learn now in Tanya, in this chapter, that that's, on some level, that's negative. That means the energy that the person produced from the food and the sleeping and the exercise did not end up in the holy side. And that's a problem. Because a Jew needs to be much more focused on their service to Hashem 24-7. How can it be 24-7? Because before you go to sleep, and when you wake up to sleep, from your sleep, you have to think, I am a servant for Hashem. Like I said before, I am a soldier for Hashem. I'm a servant. And I have to commit myself even more so, it says in Tanya later, you have to be like a son to Hashem, a child. So, you have to know that you're committing yourself with love for Hashem. But even if it's not sometimes so easy, you do it anyway, like a servant, like a soldier. That's what I said earlier. It doesn't matter how much sleep you got, if you're in the mood, if you're not in the mood, you got, you have to do what Hashem wants you to do. Now, people like our friends here on this chat, this uh, platform, you guys in my book, are tremendous people. I respect all of you, and I admire all of you, because you're willing to listen and to study and to Tanya and invest time, lots of time, in learning something that it's kind of obscure. It's not, it's not so you know easy to understand and to implement. So the question becomes, this question is, was asked to the Alter Rebbe himself, the Balatanya. What is the point of learning all these lofty ideas and concepts and high levels in Hasidus? It talks about very, very high levels of the emanations of the revelations of Hashem when we're not there. We don't 
see it. We don't understand it well. We just speak about it. So what is really the point? Like here in the Tanya, why should we learn all these lofty ideas when, when high level stuff, when we're not really holding there? We're not, it's not easy to implement it. Is it relevant? Is it practical? So the Alta Rebbe said, answer to this, to this question, yes. Because he said two things. He says, first of all, if you study it and you really believe in it and you really want it, Hashem will help that this will become your reality. It might take time, but a little bit will rub off on you. A little bit is better than nothing. The second thing he said, that we all believe in the coming of Mashiach, hopefully, hopefully very, very soon. He says, he says when Mashiach comes, all these beautiful ideas and learning and, 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 and concepts will become our reality. So you got to take it now into your mind, process it, and in your heart. And then when Mashiach comes and we will have this good, great honor and privilege to see how this is really practical, but if you never studied it, and you never were exposed to it, you have no clue, it's going to take much longer and more complicated, more complex, because you, you, you have no you have no background and no, uh, no knowledge about it. So basically, we're going to study today the inside now, chapter 7, part of it, and we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Just one second. I just got to make sure. I, I, one second, please. One second. Ay, ay, ay. Ay, ay, ay. One second. Oh, wow, wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, as I'm sitting here, I'm also trying to direct my son. One of my sons is in the JCC. They have a program for him. He has special needs. And I wanted to make sure that he got there safely. So his teacher just sent me a picture of him. Trying to juggle everything at the same time. Okay, so we got that confirmation. The seventh chapter, paid Zion. Ach, ach means, however, we just finished saying in chapter six that there are a lot of negative things in the world that cannot be elevated to Hashem, like non kosher food and negative things that the Torah says you're not allowed to you're not allowed to do so what now he's going to say there's also the neutral zone that's called Klippas Neiga these are hard words but the soul that's the Chiyunis means it gives us life force because it's in the blood like the Torah says, Ki adam hu ha but he wants animal stuff. He wants to eat, sleep, go to the bathroom, and just, you know, not do anything holy. That's the nature of people. Shemitzada klipa, hamulet, that comes from the klipa. It has the, it has the potential, it has, can go either way. Either it can go to the positive, or it can go to the ne negative. Like an animal. An animal you could use to plow the fields or, or to carry heavy loads. Or some people use animals to gore, to, to do bad things. So, which is dressed, it's in the blood of a person. That's why I told, we mentioned this already. Why does a person get weak, God forbid, when they lose their blood or chas v'shalem, should never happen. A person has a sickness in their blood, because the blood is what 
sustains us. How? Because there's a soul in the blood. The Torah says that. And that soul is not the godly soul. It's a regular soul. But it can be utilized and elevated for Kedusha. Also, he says, Nafshes. And the souls of the animals, even an animal has a soul, has a different type of soul, but it has some type of soul, some type of life force. And big animals, domestic animals, birds, fish that are kosher that you could eat. It's amazing that. Just for a second, it says in Kabbalah, the Hasidus brings it to my, to my room. That, God forbid, I don't want to get into this too much, but sometimes a person, Hashem punishes sometimes a person, and their soul ends up in the body of an animal. It's very painful for the soul. Why does that happen? Because the person during their lifetime didn't behave properly. They didn't com communicate with God. They didn't practice anything good. They were just thinking a whole day how to be more animalistic. And they can end up in, a, in, a, in an ox, in a cow, in a cat, in a dog. And, and Arizal in, in, in Shara Gilgulim talks about it. But we have to always pray to Hashem and we shouldn't go through that. What sustains? What is the energy? Even the Al-Dizal says that even doimeim, which are things that are inanimate, that don't move like rocks, wood, earth, Anything that doesn't move, doesn't grow. The Arizal says that it has a soul in it. What does that mean? Well, here we go. So it has holy energy in it. It has a, a life force in it. How do you know? But it doesn't move. It doesn't grow. So Hashem revealed to the scientists certain devices and mechanisms and they're able to look into every article rocks earth whatever it is stone wood diamonds and inside they can see movement of uh of of, of molecules and we also know there's atoms that's more difficult to see where these move, move molecules that are moving and has energy, where they come from, no one knows. Scientists can only explain to you what they see, but they cannot explain to you the source, and they cannot explain to you why it's like that. Because this is Hashem's decision. Why is this a rock? And why, <laughs> why doesn't it ever snow? In Miami in August. Doesn't snow. If the world is random. It doesn't have. God forbid. A creator who's involved. Who's mind managing the world. Then there should be random mistakes. There should be things happening. Just randomly. But it doesn't happen. It never happened. So we know. That. For instance. The Talmud and the Zohars already in their times, which is going back to about 1800 years ago, the rabbis wrote it and, and it's printed and it's published that the world is round. But the, this wasn't an invention of, of Columbus. But everyone gives credit to Columbus. He was the genius and he was the lucky man. And he... He revealed it. He discovered America and, and Americas. But really, this was already written in the earlier sources of the Torah. 
How is this? Because the Torah is the blueprint which Hashem uses to create the world. It's like an architect has a blueprint, has a sketch, how he's going to create the world. So everything in the world has a source in Torah. The same thing when it says over here that everything in life, everything in this world has energy in it. The Tanya was written about... Right, guys, you have to be quiet. Go play in the other room, please. Go, Medela. The Tanya was written about 250 years ago. Before the Industrial Revolution. Before they invented electricity. Before the scientists discovered molecules and had the right devices, the instruments to measure these things. Who, whoever knew such a thing? It's right here in front of us. Right, it says it. The energy, the life force of everything, even the inanimate, everything that grows. So, if you ask someone a hundred years ago or more, 150 years ago, how could it be that there'll be electricity in the wall that you'll be able to put up something into the wall and It'll be uh, electricity, and and you'll be able to get to, you'll put put a plug. They'll tell you what are you talking about? It's, it's a wall. What's in the wall? Wood, stucco, whatever, rocks, pebbles. What are you talking about? No, there's going to there's going to be a system. We take it for granted today, but at that time. If you were to tell someone that this is going to be the reality, they would say it can't be. How could it be that you could put in a plug, put in a wire, and you're going to have light? Light? Light. They use candles. You'll have heat or you'll have cooling. Can't be. It reminds me of a, of a person who said when they invented the, 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 the train, the locomotives, so everyone from the small shtetlach and the big cities, they came out to look at the, when the, when the train came, the first train arrived. So one guy, he jumped into the, to the, to the wagon where, where the, where the locomotive was, where the machines were, the engine, and, and, and he, and he came out very upset. He was like be be bewildered. They asked him what happened. He said, I was looking for that pony. There is a pony there. It has to be. There has to be a pony that otherwise it can't move. How can it move without a, without a little, without an animal pulling it? They said, no. That's the invention of this new uh, technology that it moves by itself. There's, there's energy. There's, a, there's a, a battery. There's electricity. There's an engine. He says, it can't be. Because his mind cannot comprehend, cannot handle that there could be such a thing, that it, it's not attached to anything physical, and yet it can move. And when they invented the, the planes, wow, that was really a, 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 like a miracle. And even that, they say that the Rambam uh, drew drawings that eventually there's going to be flying objects in the air. Okay, so going back to the Tanya. When a person speaks, a person does something, whatever he does, or he speaks, or he thinks and about food or business, things that are necessary for life, that don't have a sad isur, there's no prohibition, it's neutral. It's our survival. It's a nice way of saying that there's no, nothing at all uh, associated with Mishasa, Mrs. Leisase. There's no root and there's no branch, meaning it's a nice way of saying absolutely no connection to something negative from the 365 prohibitions, the unsaying, and its branches. It's 
details that I saw the Rabbanon, whether it's a prohibition from the Torah or from the rabbis. So what is the problem? He says, the person did whatever they did or they ate or they, they, they took a shower, whatever they did. They didn't do it to get the strength to serve Hashem. They only did it for their physical pleasure of their body and they're not thinking about that I'll take a shower and I'll, I'll, and I'll eat and I'll have more koyak so now I could serve Hashem better. Now I'll, have, I'll be able to concentrate better on the my, on my service to Hashem because I'll be more relaxed and I'll be more uh, strengthened and I'll, I'll be more um, energized. They're not thinking that. And even if he's doing something that's really necessary for his body, like eating and, 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 and drinking, he didn't think, he doesn't feel the need that, why am I eating? Because Hashem wants me to serve him better and I need to have the koyach, I need to have that strength to do it. He didn't think it. Why didn't he think so? Because it's not important to him. That's what it comes down to it. Or they never heard about this concept. So we come to chapter 7 of Tanya. And the Bala Tanya is opening up our eyes to this reality. Listen, Jew. Whatever he did till now was good. But now, baby, you're going to go to a whole different level. You got to turn it up a notch. You got to start thinking out of the box. You have to start thinking different. You have to start feeling different. You have to know that you, everything in your life is, needs to be permeated with the notion that I am a Jew and I must serve Hashem with strength, with inspiration, with joy, with everything I do. Like it says in Pirkei Yavis, I told you many times that the Balatanya, the Alter Rebbe, didn't invent anything. Everything he says has a source in the earlier writings, either in the, in the Mishnah or the Gemara or the Midrash or the Zohar. Somewhere you'll find it. But most of us are not so knowledgeable, so we can't find it. But the great Sadiqim and great rabbis, they were able to trace what the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya without any footnotes. He doesn't bring the sources, the, the, where he got it from, but they show you. There are books, holy books, that trace it. So, it says in Pekki Yavis, the whole Masecho Yiyu L'Shem Shemayim. Everything you do should be for the sake of God. But the Pekki Yavis doesn't give us the, the flip side. It doesn't say what happens if you didn't do it for Hashem's sake. It just says, it advises you, do the right thing. Okay. And if not, what happens? Uh, for this, you have to learn the ch chapter 7 of Tanya. Over here, the Alter Rebbe spells it out. He gives you exactly the, the situation, the way it is. He doesn't shy back. He doesn't hold back words. I stopped a little bit in the middle because I want to explain all these things. But basically, it's a, it's a long sentence. He's saying that if a person does not think or feel that what they're doing for their body is for the purpose of serving Hashem, so their action or their speech or their thoughts are animalistic and basically it's it's negative because you didn't bring godliness into the process so if it's not godly it's not good he's not saying it's a sin but it is problematic it needs to be elevated it needs to be corrected <laughs> These are 
little bit complicated words. It means that everything will end up. Everything has energy in this. In, everything in this existence, in our existence, has energy. The question is, where is this energy coming from? Is it coming from the holy side? Or it's coming from the unholy side. So he says that when a person does not utilize what they're doing for holiness, where is the energy coming from? Your thought or your speech or your action. Don't kid yourself, the Alter Rebbe says. Don't, you know... Pretend you don't know. I'm going to tell you the way it is. He's telling us. He's spelling it out for us. It doesn't come from the from the holiness side. It's coming. It's coming from the third, the fourth klipa, which is a neutral klipa. It's called klipas neiga. Neiga means light because the, it's different than the other three that we mentioned, that there's three klipas that are dark, meaning that they're not holy. And this one has some light in it. It could be used for good stuff, for holiness, for positive energy, or for negative. Again, that this world has is called the world of Asiya. Most of it is bad. Bad means not evil, not, you know, like terrible, like malice, destruction. Bad means that it's not good. It's not holy. It's not proper. It's not positive. You didn't do anything with it. So most people, they live a life they eat, they sleep, they earn money, they go on vacation. Most of their life <laughs> is not full of content of something that really makes a difference to Hashem and for the Jewish people. It's a selfish life, basically. Most of us, 99.999, we're all very selfish people. Okay, that's the way Hashem made us. But he also wants us to go out of the box and do something for the right reason. So when you learn Tanya, the Alter Rebbe challenges all the Hasidim, all the from people, all the not from people, even the Goyim. He says, Hevre, listen. There is a standard that Hashem created and established in the Torah. That's Hashem's standard. You can't say, I don't want to be bothered. You don't want to be bothered. Okay. I don't want to know, so I don't have to be bothered. What I have to learn, Tanya? And uh, feel uncomfortable because maybe I'm not doing the right thing. I won't learn. I won't study. I won't know. I don't want to live a happy life. Leave me alone. So there's some people who say this and think like that. But that's silly because at the end of the day, you want to do the right thing. And if you become more mature, you don't run away from responsibilities. You have to deal with responsibilities in a mature way. No one's standing here with a hammer banging you over the head and saying, you're a bad person because you didn't do everything perfect. Hashem doesn't expect us to be perfect. It says in the Talmud, the Torah was not given to angels. We're not angels. We have a lot of stuff in our head that we have to clean out. So the Tanya is helping us clean up this negative stuff to become better people. And every day of life, we have this exercise to do the right thing. If someone says, I don't want to, that's his choice. He or she. You don't want to, don't. No, so, so you let, you'll you'll have to deal with it in another time, in another way. You know, later on, someone's gonna ask you. It's like going to therapy. 
If you don't open up, eventually it's going to burst. The best thing, the healthiest thing is open it up, deal with it, let it flow, vent, and you'll be able to feel much better. So here we go. There is a little bit good. That from the from the good that's even in the nefesh Bahamis and the animal comes the good feelings means proper attributes and feelings and emotions that everyone has. I'm going to finish in a moment. And I'm going to take questions. Just a few more lines. This neutral tone is uh, between the three clippers and the holy side. Like food. Food is neutral. Eat it for the sake of Hashem. And God forbid you don't say a blessing on it. And you don't pay attention that it has, there is some godly purpose in it. It ends up in clipper. It ends up energy that it's impure. It's in, and it's it's no good. It's in, it's negative. Which cost of is a holy book from the Rizal that his student wrote. He brings it in the name of the Zoyar. This this concept that we're discussing here. So I told you that out of it is eight high, this safer, and they don't know it's difficult to understand what's written there. And it's more difficult to comprehend how it sometimes all it fits in and it sinks it sinks is synced uh, to, to that that it's it has to synchronize and to be you know exactly how to fit in to, uh, and to direct us in our daily life. So and the same he says the name of the Zayar. Everyone could open the Zayar, but you have to understand how to learn Zayar. The Altarabi used to teach his children and his grandson the the depths of the Zayar. And we have many, many writings of the teachings of the Alter Rebbe, how he explains Zohar. So if you don't know how to learn Zohar, you just, you know, take the the superficial meaning. If you want to go deeper into it, you got to listen to the teaching of the Alter Rebbe. Sometimes we can take the things that are neutral and elevated to Kedusha, like food or sleeping or vision. An exercise, if you say, I want to do it for the, the sake of being happy with my family, with myself, I have more strength and more motivation to be a better Jew, to serve Hashem with more clarity, with more joy, then you're elevating for holiness. What the good that's mixed into the negative, this barimara gets refined, gets separated from the negative, and it goes stronger and it's integrated into Kedusha. Now, again, I want to say that this chapter of Tanya particularly is not an easy portion. It's going to get a little bit easier now, the next section. But this was a little bit, uh, let's say, uh, complex or complicated to explain. I did, I tried my best as I understand it or, and how I feel it. And I, again, commend each one of you for listening uh, and, and, and participating. And, and I hope, you know, that we'll make the best out of it. Now I see it's uh, 15 minutes left. I would like to see, if, you know, hear from you guys, get some feedback, and have <laughs> nice discussions. Rabbi? Yes. Thank you for your lesson. I think your explanation was excellent, and I got it. 
Okay, very good. You're always you're always uh, complimenting me, and I appreciate it. But sometimes, if there's something that you know you need to say, speak up and give a little bit constructive criticism. Uh, it's important because I know that it's coming from a the good only, place. The only thing I can criticize is your computer. There was a section there where your, your voice was breaking up. But otherwise, it was good. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that's not in my control. I'm, I'm sitting in the same place. And I want to tell you guys that I don't have, uh, you know, so much patience to sit for an hour and teach Tanya. So for me personally, I am working on myself to be more focused and more grounded and more inspired and to settle down and learn from all of you, including Rabbi Smith, who has a tremendous amount of patience and to go through it, not to get uh, impatient and go line by line and explain and try to do it the best way that I can do it. But I am not, uh, have, you know, been doing this for since, I don't know. I mean, all the other classes that I do are not for an hour. An hour is a long time, in my opinion. I, I would rather keep it short. But Rabbi Smith says, no, we got to do it Sunday for an hour. So I go with his directive. I go with his, uh, follow his, his advice. And... Baruch Hashem, we're, this, we're getting better at it. You're helping me getting better at it, figuring it out, and trying my best. You know, I, I want to tell you already on Friday, I was preparing the Tanya for today. It takes time. It takes a lot this, of commitment. And uh, last night, I went to sleep. Uh, we had a Fabreng in here for my son's birthday, turned 30 years old. A lot of Hasidim came here. I, I, I went to sleep at 1.30 in the morning. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I woke up at 6. I'm talking California time. I, wouldn't, I didn't want to miss. I don't want to miss. But this is not a simple thing I, when you think about it. I want to say. You guys make me, uh, you know, you inspire me. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. I want to say that this this concept of Sitra Achra being in between the good and the bad seems a new concept to me. To me, always Sitra Achra was the bad. But now that I can see that there might be some good in it too, and, and you can elevate it, it's a very interesting uh, concept for me. Yeah, that's exactly what I was telling you, that most people, even people who learn Talmud, and uh, they're familiar with a lot of Torah. They don't know. They don't. They don't have this concept. They don't yeah. know about it because it's a chidush. It's something that the Arizal talks about, and uh, we trust his opinion, his teachings. And there are from people that don't want to learn this stuff, yes. and it makes them uncomfortable. And they say they're not ready for it. And um, they sh stay away. But we n n are told by our holy tzaddikim that we have to grow and study it and learn about it and implement it as best as we can. Actually, so, uh, Rabbi, I'm sorry. Uh, Rabbi, this actually brings people a lot of hope. Because through your own action of your prayers, your brachas, you can actually elevate that which is neutral and bring it up. So it brings hope to me personally. You know, um, I don't know why people would be afraid of it, especially if you didn't know about it. Then all of a sudden you're brought this tool where you can be, you know, bring things up and, um, and not be negative. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I'm, 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 I'm listening carefully. 
because you're putting the the the, the proper perspective. Yeah, uh -huh. that's why it's interesting to listen to you guys, because when I speak, I'm I'm teaching, you know, how a chassid learns Tanya, uh, so that's one perspective. Then I listen to you guys, and you're new to it, and or or you know you're learning it and 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 explaining it from your perspective. It it's more real. It's more tangible, and this is exactly. What, what, why we have to learn together, to listen and to share the views and the perspectives so we could learn from each other. And it's very important. Rabbi, I have a question, if I may. Um, it's really great that you're, you know, you're sharing this with us and I'm new to this. And I think one of the things I'm trying to understand is, and again, using the, having the Tanya as a source and what you've just said, there's a balance or a fight between, like you say, people don't want to know about it. So it's between having a better intellectual understanding versus an emotional understanding. And there's a greater value in having that intellectual understanding as part of your, your growth. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> if you I just wanted to ask you, I'm sorry for cutting you off. Um, what, what exactly in this parak are you emphasizing that you find to be so radical or, or hard to under, I'm just wondering what specific point is the, uh, to you, the most like unique point or radical point or uh, uh, hard to connect with? Which, which you know, you, you he, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to answer you. He says that if you don't do, the, if you don't, think that you're doing it for Hashem's sake, it's not, it doesn't remain in the neutral zone. It goes down to the negative zone. To the You just created a situation of total negativity, of impurity. What, what, you, why? I'm eating kosher food. Uh -huh. Right, okay. I thought you were. That's radical. Yes. Right. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, in other words, you ruin it worse than uh, than it is. It doesn't just stay neutral. It goes down. Exactly. It, 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 who wants to hear that? That's uh, that's like the gentleman just said before. That that if you know about it, then you could fix the problem. And it's worse. Most people. When they don't know how to correct the problem, a situation, they get frustrated. That's where anxiety comes up because they lose, they don't have control. The Alter Rebbe is giving us here the tools to know what's right, what's wrong, how to fix it, how to elevate it. He's giving us the tools and the information not to have anxiety, not to be in, in limbo, not to be nervous. You could, there is a way to fix it. He's taking the gems, the pearls from the Zohar and from the Eight Sky and the holy writings of the Arizal, which basically were books, holy svarim, that very few people ha understood and understand. And he's bringing it down to a level that simple people like us could, could relate to it and can help us become better Jews, better people, and to fulfill our mission in this world. So Rabbi, practically speaking, let's talk. Right. Yeah. I have a question either for you or both you and Rabbi speak.